Well, good morning. In the 1990s, Hugh McKay, uh, Australian sociologist, wrote a book entitled Why Don't People Listen? Now, it was advice to help us communicate better amongst one another. Advice like, people only listen to things that directly concern them. Now, when it comes to the hot topic of suffering, sickness, evil, people, like you and me, we have reasons as to why we won't listen to the Bible and God on this issue. One of those reasons might be that we want to be free of other authorities like the Bible and God. The second reason is once we break free of God, then we become the rule makers. And so uh, one of those rules in our society uh, today is that suffering is always wrong. So if I cause suffering to someone else because I don't agree with their lifestyle, then that's wrong. It's always wrong. Maybe the last reason today that we can talk about is if, um, if suffering is always wrong, well then how can we believe in a God who allows the coronavirus to run rampant around the world? He mustn't exist. Now, apart from intellectual reasons for not listening, we also come with emotional reasons that make it hard to listen. So all of us are suffering uh, at, to some extent now in lockdown. But some of us are dealing with much greater suffering than others. I come to this topic of suffering having suffered very little. But you may be in a, in a fight for your life. Wherever we're coming from today, I just want to urge you not to turn off this live stream because the reason stopping you from listening may not be valid reasons. The God that you think doesn't exist may not be the actual God of the Bible. In fact, I can almost guarantee that he's not if you're thinking like this. So just stay with me for 20 minutes or so and listen to who the real God is. He is good, he is sovereign, he suffers with us and for us, and he will return to destroy all suffering. And if you come to know and trust in this God, the real God, you will find yourself able to face suffering now with hope because you know that God has dealt with suffering once for all in his son Jesus. So stick with me. Now, our gut reaction to any event which causes us pain is, who's to blame? It's, it's, it's my children's first reaction. I say, what happened here? Why is Sophie crying? And they say, well, he started it. Deflect the blame. What did Adam say when God asked him, have you eaten from this tree I commanded you not to eat from? Now, the right answer would have been, Yes, I have. What does Adam say? The woman you put here with me. That's blaming God for the woman. She gave me some fruit from the tree. That's blaming Eve for the temptation, and I ate it. You see, Adam is innocent. God and the woman are to blame. Now, what happens when COVID-19 starts infecting whole countries and the entire world shuts down? Well, we start looking for scapegoats. Uh, the, the Wuhan province, the wet markets, Chinese New Year. And many times we blame God. Now, although our gut reaction is, uh, is right, that there's someone to blame, our conclusion that it's God, that he's a fiend, that he's unjust and unfair, well, that's a wrong conclusion. Because God is totally and utterly good. But we... Well, we are bad down to the bone. My boys have taken to the saying, I'm good, if they, um, if they don't want to eat anything anymore or something like that. And I keep saying, no, you're not. You're bad. And wondering, where does that phrase come from? Does it come from a, a culture that, that is, uh, is trying to sell the lie that human beings are good at heart when we're actually bad at heart? Now, the Bible knows all about our sinful tendencies to deflect blame from ourselves to others and even to God. James, one of the uh, brothers of Jesus and also one of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem, 
he's, he writes to Christians scattered all over the empire. And these Christians were undergoing trials of many kinds, James says. And James says, don't blame God for your temptations to sin. Those temptations come from inside of us, not from God. So in verse 13 of chapter 1, this is what James writes. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But we can, and we are. James goes on. Because God is good in himself, everything he creates and gives to us is also good. So verse 16 of chapter 1. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters, writes James. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. You think that God once looked on you with favor, and that's why he gave you good gifts, but he's changed towards you. And that's why you are experiencing trials and hard times. No, says James, God never changes like shifting shadows. He's always good. He always gives good and perfect gifts. And here's some news for us. Those trials that you're facing, they're also good gifts from God. To strengthen your faith, to give you hope in the new heavens and the new earth so that you might hold a little less tightly to the things of this world that are passing away. Don't deflect the blame onto God for the coronavirus or for any other sickness or suffering. God is good, and all of his creation is good, even mankind. Humanity was created good in the beginning, but we have made a mess of it. This only have I found, says Solomon, the wise man. God created man upright, but they have gone in search of many schemes. We've said no to God and become bad in ourselves, in our hearts. And because of the sin in us, God has cursed us with death and decay, judgment. Sickness, the coronavirus, is a part of our death and decay. For God not only cursed us, but he cursed the ground, the environment in which we live. This is what God says to Adam. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It is really important to remember during a pandemic like this that the world that we are living in now isn't the good world that came forth from a good God in the beginning. Sure, everything that God creates is good still good but because of our badness our sin God's good world is mucked up you know Christianity is the only faith that teaches this reality God's world is still good but it's been cursed because of our badness and that this world is destined for destruction Islam won't give you the total depravity of the human heart Buddhism is very positive toward human ability. The solution to suffering is that you get rid of desire, you stop your desire. And of course, how do you stop it? By your right thinking and your right action. Humanism puts humans in the center of reality. Christianity puts the blame squarely on us for suffering and sickness. And God provides the solution. He's not the problem. The problem is us. Another version of the blame game, which we often play, is comparing ourselves to one another. If we can show that others are suffering more than us, then we can rest assured that they are greater sinners. The U.S., what a sinful nation it is. How that nation has wrought havoc and and destruction in the world. And now it's getting its just desserts. The coronavirus is rampant there because God is punishing that nation 
for its many sins. But we Australians, hey, the bell curve is flattened. And that's because God sees that we're a more uh, righteous nation than the U.S. Now, that's just our mucked up logic thinking there. In Luke 13, Jesus cuts through our blame game. He addresses us, you and me. No blame shifting here. You and I are responsible to God alone for our sins. In this passage, Pilate, to the governor who oversaw the trial of Jesus, has mixed the blood of certain Galileans into their sacrifices. Now, this was a sacrilegious act, a dastardly act. And uh, many interpreted this act as those Galileans must have been really bad because they're being punished this way. But Jesus says, no, you're wrong. This is what he says. Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or these 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. So we cannot draw the conclusion from the amount of suffering that someone suffers that they are greater sinners than us. Don't play the blame game, nor the comparison game. Why was my brother born with a muscular dystrophy that means his muscles are wasting away? He can hardly walk now. And here am I, skipping around the place and throwing my children in the air. I don't know why. The answers are known to God alone. But one thing we can be sure about, suffering, sickness, pain, well, it's God's message to us to repent, turn away from our sin, and to turn to God for salvation. C.S. Lewis, a Christian thinker from last century, writes, we can ignore even pleasure but pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Are you hearing God's voice speaking loudly through suffering, through his megaphone of suffering? Turn away from your sinful ways and turn to him Trust him that he has dealt with all of your sin and, and, uh, and um, everything, all of your evil, completely in Jesus. So pray with me at the end of this talk if you want to change your life. Well, that's the first point. God is good and we are bad. Second point is that God is sovereign and we are limited. God is sovereign, all-powerful, and we are limited. Second thing that we tend to do when confronted with our weakness, like a lockdown, is we project our weaknesses onto others, even to God. We were searching recently for a dog. Um, We went to see one. My kids were with me. They got really excited. But I said, I need a little more time to decide. And while I was deciding, the dog was sold to another family. My kids were distraught because of my inability to decide we lost the dog. Now, I have to tell you, we bought another dog later on, and my kids are pretty happy with him. Now, yes, pain is sometimes due to our incompetencies, of which I have many. But we do the same thing with God. We look out at the coronavirus, it's running rampant, people dying all over the world, the race is on to develop a vaccine, but that might be months, maybe years away, and we think God is incompetent. What is he doing in heaven right now? Is he on holiday while we die down here? Surely if he's all-powerful, he could stop this, but he's not. He's lost control. We've got to help mankind. If we help mankind, then we're going to get through this. But God 
well, he's not tough enough to do the job himself. And when we lose confidence in God's sovereignty like that, the mistake some religious people make is to partition out the good and the bad. So we say, God gets all the good stuff. Satan's got the bad stuff. Life is a battle between the good and the bad. And we just hope the good wins, but we don't know until the end. Now that's just not a, a, a false sentiment of religious people. The yin and the yang, the dark and the bright, the negative and the positive of Chinese philosophy. Again, it's a dualism set up to describe the balance and inconnectedness between good and evil in the world. Because they cannot conceive of a God that sovereignly controls evil and yet remains untainted by it. But the Bible teaches that very thing about God. He is sovereign. He is completely powerful over suffering, sickness and, and evil. And he uses it all in his plans and purposes. And yet his character remains untouched by evil. Now probably the most well-known Old Testament sufferer is a man called Job. He is a righteous man who suffers but not because he did anything wrong in this instance, because God wants to test his faith. Did he trust God and do good because God gave him good things or because God is worthy of Job's trust? Well, Satan strikes Job's whole family down. Job responds by praising the Lord who gives and takes away. The devil with permission from God, of course, then strikes Job himself with painful sores. Now, seeing his misery, his wife uh, encourages Job to curse God and die. And Job rebukes her with these words, Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Job doesn't curse God, but he demands an audience with God to explain why he is suffering. Now, this is a very long book, but right at the end, God gives Job an audience. But this conversation, this audience is not what Job expected. God doesn't answer, but God questions him. This is what God says. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me and justify yourself? Do you have an arm like God's? Can your voice thunder like his? Then adorn yourself with glory and splendor and clothe yourself in honor and majesty. Unleash the fury of your wrath. Look at all who are proud and bring them low. Look at all who are proud and humble them. Crush the wicked where they stand. Bury them all in the dust together. Shroud their faces in the grave. And then I myself will admit to you that your own right hand can save you. God doesn't answer to us. We answer to him. He is the potter. We are the clay. This is what Job discovered through his pain and his suffering. He didn't get a reason from God for his suffering, but he did get an answer as to how to respond to God in his suffering. God is sovereign. We are limited. Leave the control of the world up to God. We can trust him to do the right thing, even amidst our pain. So will you do that? Will you trust in this sovereign God of Job? Will you live by faith that he controls and even uses the most powerful of suffering to fulfill his purposes? Because that's the real God of the Bible. That's who we're talking about God is more powerful than you and I can ever imagine. If you remember our, our Old Testament Bible reading from Isaiah 45, God uses pagan kings like Cyrus, who don't even acknowledge him, to save and judge his rebellious people Israel. And then he judges Cyrus. No one, nothing is greater than God and will destroy or thwart his plans. At the center of Christianity is the death of the Lord Jesus. Here is the climax of God's plans for the world. 
It looks like everything has gone wrong. God has lost control. The devil has the upper hand. The enemies of God and God's people win. But looks can be deceiving. Because the cross is the very demonstration of God's incredible power and sovereignty. At the cross, God demonstrates his justice. For he punishes all of our sins in his son at the cross. At the cross, God shows his mercy to a sinful world, to you and me. Jesus, God incarnate, takes my sin and your sin onto his perfect self and pays for it instead of us. At the cross, we see the limitedness of human beings and the, their depravity. The Jews, the Gentiles, together putting the innocent Son of God to, to death on a cross. And all the while, they were playing the role that God had ordained for them to bring salvation and judgment to the entire world. Peter, in his first speech after the resurrection of Jesus, reminds his fellow Jews what they just accomplished for God by crucifying Jesus. This is what he says. This man, Jesus, was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Isn't it a comfort to know that no one or nothing can ruin the plans and purposes of this sovereign God? Not even suffering, cruelty, the evil plans of human beings, of the devil, nothing can defeat the good and sovereign God from dealing with your sins, with my, from dealing with, with my death, with our judgment, by laying the judgment, our judgment, on his own son Jesus to bring us forgiveness. Christianity is the only belief that has a real solution to our real problem. Jesus is the only way to forgiveness and restoration with a just God. First point, God is good. We are not. Second point, God is sovereign and we are limited. Thirdly, God suffers with us and for us. God does something about our sickness and suffering. He righteously judges it in his son and he extends mercy to us. This is much more than any other worldview offers. Atheism just ignores evil. If the world was made by chance, well, there's no purpose to this world. No morality. As Richard Dawkins, physicist and atheist, says, the universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect. If there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, Nothing but pitiless indifference. And when it comes to death, atheism says death wins. We just rot in the ground. So are you really going to put your faith in such a hopeless worldview? God has come into our world in the person of Jesus. He has suffered with us as our flesh and blood. He knows what it's like to suffer and to feel our pain. He suffered much more than you and I have. He suffered the punishment of his heavenly Father for us. So he knows what it's like, and he can help us. He hasn't just come to sit with us in our misery, but to rescue us out of our suffering. And he did that on the cross when he suffered for us. But the fruit of his work isn't yet completely seen. For we still live in a world groaning under the judgment of God. You and I still live in a world where a virus can spread across the globe, killing nearly 200,000 people already in a matter of months. But there is a day coming when God will finally destroy all evil. That's my final point today. First point, God is good and we are not. Second one, God is sovereign and we are limited Thirdly, God suffers with us and for us. And finally, 
God will destroy all evil. Jesus will return to destroy all suffering and sickness and evil. Do you remember our New Testament reading from the uh, book of Romans? And here Paul is explaining what life is like now for Christians. It's not for non-Christians. It's for Christians while we wait for Jesus to return. And Paul's message is we will suffer now. We will suffer as humans because we still live in a world groaning under God's judgment. And we will suffer as Christians Paul writes in verse 17 of Romans 8, Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Jesus said to his disciples when he was with them, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. But in our suffering, God helps us. He gives us the Holy Spirit who mediates our prayers to the Father, verse 26. And we have the knowledge that God is good and sovereign over evil for us. Paul writes in verse 28 of Romans chapter 8, We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. What is his purpose? To make us more like Jesus in everything including suffering. And finally, God gives us hope, a certain hope that's based on Jesus' death for us 2,000 years ago. Paul writes in verse 23, We ourselves, we who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. I remember what it was like when I was a child and I was waiting for Christmas morning. I used to say to open my gifts, I used to say to my uh, mum and dad, I can't wait. And they would say, you have to wait. And in the days leading up to Christmas, the the waiting was almost unbearable. But I did wait, mostly, I think. And Christmas mornings did come around. But imagine what it would be like if I opened one of those presents early. Now that expectation, that longing, that hope would disappear. Suffering develops in us Christians a longing for Jesus to come back. A hope that he will destroy evil forever. That he will rescue us. That he will transform these weak bodies into new eternal ones, free of viruses. How glorious it will be. Much more glorious than the sufferings that we now endure. So wait, brothers and sisters. Wait patiently in hope. Wait for Jesus to come and we will see an end to our suffering and pain. Jesus made that certain when he died on a cross for us and rose again 2,000 years ago. And again, if you aren't yet a Christian, please listen to suffering. Listen to the coronavirus. Allow it to drive you to the God of the Bible, a good, a sovereign God who suffered with us, with you and for you to give you hope, the eternal hope of eternal life don't delay put your trust in him today and let us help you do that connect with us via the web page well let's finish in prayer dear heavenly father we admit that we are rebels against you this world is groaning under your judgment on our sin we deserve your judgment please forgive us not because of anything we have done, but because Jesus suffered in our place. Please change us. Help us to follow Jesus, to suffer like him. Please use our suffering to make us more like him and to strengthen our hope in Jesus' return. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.